and welcome to the Digital and Carbogen Amsys Limited Q4 FY20 Earnings Conference Call. As a reminder, all participant clients will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Arshad Piyas. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you, thank you, moderator. Uh, dear all, welcome to the yearly con call of uh, uh, Dishman Carbon Nancy's Limited. Uh, it has been a while since uh, all the global pandemics have been going on since uh, COVID, uh, and we sincerely hope that no family members or uh, yourselves uh, have been affected negatively by this um, tremendous pandemic. And uh, we wish you all the health and support uh, and strength in case you do have faced such uh, failures. Um, and uh, with that, I would like to bring to notice uh, a few important facts of uh, the companies and then uh, post that the numbers and the business strategies could be uh, uh, guided to you by Mark, uh, uh, our global CEO, and uh, uh, Herschel, our global CFO. Uh, in the recent events, you might have heard that we have uh, faced uh, a failure of EDQM. This failure is uh, uh, of the company, uh, of the people of the company who the management interested in, and that has uh, allowed us to kind of uh, create a massive reorganization in the company for the betterment to create a kind of a singularity of all our global assets and wealth in terms of people to come together and uh, face this issue uh, head on, for which reason we have been able to create a global task force where we have taken a competent quality officer from each and every location that we are present in and come together as a team to help fight this cause and to make sure that we come out to be better and stronger, not just, but to even raise the bar of quality for the entire country as it is looked at in terms of the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical segment. This is what we believe in, and we will make sure that it happens. Uh, the change in the organization has allowed us to pick the right people who are actually caring for the company and to escalate them to the level where they are going to help us in the next phase of our journey to become the best possible pharmaceutical company of the country, which is our vision. And this is we are confident of achieving. Um, and uh, for, uh, for that reason, we would request your trust and support in us, uh, as you have always have in difficult times as well as in uh, good times. These are difficult times, we, uh, and we hope that you would extend your support once again. And rest assured, your trust in us will not be going in vain. The numbers of the last year have been very good. Um, this year, we will not be able to say the same. We don't know exactly what the, the exact guidance is going to be. But uh, we, of course, because of the recent uh, EDQM failures, we expect a little bit of uh, downfall happening. But at the same time, what we have been able to do is to focus on the customers who were affected and did all the risk assessments. And we are glad to inform that our major customers, the risk assessment that we have done are not impacted and have qualified us to be okay, uh, even with the EDQM failures. So the major part of the business, uh, which is the cram segment, is be affected uh, uh, in the matter that it might have been perceived. What will be affected is the marketable molecule segment, which is uh, our own um, IP of uh, the CEPs, uh, which is constituting to not more than about $15 million worth of business, which we are hoping to grow had we not had the failure. but as of now, that will have to wait, but 
it has uh, as i said earlier allowed us to uh, come together as a team globally which we always intended to do we are very confident of the business going forward we are very confident of the pipeline going forward our focus and strength is uh, into innovation which is uh, of course going to take time and um we expect your true and uh, uh, true support in that matter if you have any questions we will be more than happy to answer without a doubt with that we would like to move uh, i would like mark to add a few uh, comments thanks up um first of all i echo up its sentiments we sincerely hope that you and your families have not been affected uh, by this uh, covid pandemic and uh, we wish you all the best health so as i've explained we have uh, faced two challenges in this period of time since we last spoke to you in january uh the first one of course is the uh, covid-19 pandemic which has affected pretty much every company in every country in the world in some way shape or form um we were fortunate uh during the late part of february to take a call in europe uh where we could see that potentially there were some issues coming out of china with uh with with covid and we uh, put some plans in place which enabled us to keep operations running across our european assets um even during the worst times so we've been able to maintain output at a at a pretty high level by being able to send people home who are uh, able to work from home setting them up in home offices so our IT teams have uh, been able to do that very efficiently um and that has provided space in our building so that we can maintain some level of social distancing as a result of that in Europe we have only had one case of covid-19 and that person was actually a project manager who uh, lived and worked from home in Italy and he actually lived right in the epicenter of the Italian break breakout so he didn't catch that as part of the business he caught that from his leisure time so uh, from a european perspective we have managed it's not been easy but uh, we have been able to maintain a reasonable level of output and we anticipate as switzerland france and holland start to emerge from the covid crisis and start to uh, relax restrictions that we uh, we should be able to get back to our normal levels of uh, service uh at the indian level um we've had the same principles of isolation the indian lockdown especially in gujarat has been very tough and has restricted the heavily restricted the movement of people from their homes to their places of work and have uh, meant that we require special permits and documentation we have been able to do that but that has impacted our output coupled with that is we have had the uh, event of the EDQM audit which as I've said uh impacted both our, our marketed molecules sector which also included a uh, number of our small volume uh, generics that we market um we have over the last 6 weeks um got our global task force working uh, across the board we have completed all risk assessments for all customers and to date we have no product recourse uh our key customers uh we have obviously prioritized heavily to ensure that the uh, supply of material to the market continues and we've been successful in doing that the long term impact will be difficult to assess from a market perspective but internally coupled with the reorganization of the business uh, in india which i have mentioned uh will enable us to get back on a steady footing and uh, be able to grow again but uh that will take a little bit of time with that uh i'm quite obviously quite happy to give you updates on various things including adc's technology and all the all those other things that we talk about our operations in china were not affected at all thankfully um this happened over chinese new year the covid outbreak in china fortunately we were doing some refurbishments and modifications in the facilities and most people did not go home for Chinese New Year therefore 
They stayed in the Shanghai area, isolated in our facilities, and we have had not one case of COVID-19 in our organization in Shanghai um, as a result of uh, people not going back home over Chinese New Year. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand over to uh, Hashim Dalal, our CFO, who can talk you through uh, the uh, summary of the numbers. Over to you, Hashil. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, very good uh, afternoon evening to, to everybody. Um, um, like Carpet and Mark, I hope, um, um, you know, I would like to say that I hope that all of your families, everybody is doing well in the COVID-19 situation and uh, nobody's impacted. Um, with that, getting straight to the numbers, I'm sure you would have had a chance to go through it. Uh, but for the benefit of everybody, I'll just uh, run through the numbers really quickly and mention the key highlights. Uh, our, our total revenue, including the operating income for the quarter, was uh, 512 crores as compared to 650 crores in the comparable quarter last year. As all of you would remember, last year in Q4, um, you know, it, it was an exceptional quarter for us. The bulk of the sales uh, for the full financial year happened in the last quarter. Most of the commercial supplies went out in the last quarter and hence the, the, the quarterly sales was extremely high. Uh, this year, what we witnessed was that the sales was more or less evenly spread across all the four quarters, though we were expecting certain additional commercial sales to go out in the last quarter. Uh, that is kind of step forward um, into the first quarter um, and, 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 and Q2 uh, because of the customer requirements as well as uh, because of the COVID-19. Uh, so that was on the revenue. Uh, as far as our EBITDA for the quarter is concerned, it was at uh, 26%. So we did an EBITDA of about 132 crores as compared to uh, 169 crores in the comparable quarter, uh, which again equates to about 26%. The profit before tax was about 60 crores as compared to 105 crores in the comparable quarter last year. Um, one other important thing that I wanted to mention was uh, the other operating income for the quarter. So uh, last year, uh, if you recall, we had a total uh, foreign exchange realized gain sitting in the in the other operating income for the year uh, at 112 crores, of which 38 crores was booked in the last quarter of the financial year 2019. As compared to that, uh, this year the total realized foreign exchange gain for the full financial year was 43 crores as part of the other operating income, and for the quarter it was about uh, about 8 crores. So uh, there, there is a there is a definite impact of the of the foreign exchange realized gains on the on the data as well as on the profit before tax. Uh, the tax for for the quarter was, um, and again, you know, it, it's exceptional. The, the tax for the quarter is is a negative uh, 12 crores. Um, the, the reason for that is that we had a, a write back of certain amount of provision of taxes that was done in the earlier year. Number one, number two, uh, we were writing off the deferred tax asset in the Shanghai operations. Uh, till December 2019. Uh, the good thing is that all of the DAFA tax asset has been written off and hence uh, starting Q1 of, uh, of the current calendar year or Q4 of financial year 2020, there will be no additional DAFA tax assets that will be written off in Shanghai. Uh, we, we also, uh, under the new tax regime, which is applicable from the 1st of January uh, 2020 in Switzerland, uh, the, the effective tax rate goes down from 20% to now about 18%, and in a staggered way, that is expected to go down to about 13.5% as per the new CTR3 guidelines, which have been enacted from 1st of January 2020. Uh, so we should see our effective tax rates uh, remaining around 25% as compared to about uh, 31, 32% uh, that we have seen up till now. In India, we are yet to take a call on um, 
on whether to go for the new tax regime or remain under the earlier one. Uh, obviously, if you go under the new tax regime, the effective tax rate in India as well would be about 25%. So our reported profit after tax uh, for the full financial year um, or, or for the quarter ended March 31, 2020 was 72 crores as compared to 75.7 crores in the comparable quarter last year. As far as the full year figures are concerned, our revenue um, purely from sales was about 1,973 crores as compared to 1,919 crores in the comparable year last year. Uh, the total revenue, including the operating income this year or FY20 was 2,044 crores as compared to 2,058 crores. The EBITDA this year was 522 crores as compared to 552 crores. So if you, if you take out the impact of the, of the, of the realized foreign exchange gain, uh, that is to the tune of about 70 crores, uh, the net differential, uh, then the EBITDA actually grew this year as compared to the last financial year. Uh, the depreciation for the year was much higher. So the depreciation was 282 crores as compared to 240 crores in the last financial year. This is, uh, along with the finance cost, is on account of the implementation of IFRS 16 from 1st of April uh, 2019 wherein um, under the new standards for leases, uh, we need to recognize the lease asset and the lease liability, and the rental expenditure gets classified as, uh, as depreciation and finance costs based upon the net present value. Uh, the, 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 the finance cost of 62 crores uh, for the year includes a, a, a foreign exchange loss, of about uh, about 9.18 crores. Uh, this loss in the last financial year was about 7.79 crores. So this is this largely represents the the market market impact on account of the foreign exchange rate movement uh, to the to, to the extent of the rupee cost of borrowing on our on our overall borrowing. Uh, the profit before tax for the year was 222 crores as compared to 308 crores for the, for the financial year 2019. Uh, the tax expense for the year, the effective tax rate was 19% as compared to 32% in the last financial year. This was largely on account of the, uh, of the reasons that I mentioned. Uh, because of which our profit after tax for the full financial year was 180 crores as compared to 210 crores in financial year 19. So overall, uh, you know, this, this was the, the, the financial highlights for the year and the quarter. Uh, certain other things that I wanted to mention was, uh, were in regards to the debt figures. So on net debt as of 31st March 2019, was about 120 million because all of our uh, borrowings is in foreign currency. It would be better to look at it in, a, in foreign currency terms. So in US dollar terms, it was US dollar 120 million as of March 31, 2019. As compared to that, as of March 31, 2020, uh, the net debt figure is 100 million. So there is a reduction in the net debt figure by about 20 million in the in the in the full financial year. Um, as far as our buyback is concerned, which was uh, announced in January, we have completed about 50% uh, of the of the total buyback size. So, about 30 of buyback has already been completed uh, 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 as of now. Um, as far as our balance sheet is concerned, uh, certain key highlights. Uh, in, if you look at it, um, the, the trade receivables have, have increased as compared to the last financial year. Uh, the, the major reason for the increase in the receivables is because of the of the unbilled uh, debtors. So, as you know, we have huge amount of uh, service revenue that we book at uh, Carbon Analysis uh, AG. Uh, because of which there is there, there is uh, there is an unveiled debtor uh, which sits in the balance sheet uh, because the revenue is booked upon the percentage of completion method. Um, 
our our overall investment uh, cash and cash equal balance they keep on growing uh, every year so we have been generating good amount of uh, of free cash flow every year the capital expenditure that was actually incurred in the last financial year was uh, close to about uh, 42 million uh, so this capital expenditure was was largely on account of the maintenance capex across all of our plants Certain additional capital expenditure on account of the of, of the growth capex that we did in Switzerland uh, for the new building, as well as in India for the for the software capital plant. Um, so these this were more or less the, the the financial highlights for the year and the quarter ended March 31, 2020. Uh, with that, I'll hand over the call to uh, Mr. Sanjay Majumdar, our independent director. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and again, of course, first of all, wishing you all of your good health and prayers that everything is going to be good. Uh, most of the points are covered, but two, three very quick uh, mention. Uh, Arpit, Mark, they all mentioned about uh, EDQM, but as uh, Mark clarified that for most of our long-term customers, the risk audits are over and there is no big impact that is likely to be felt. Secondly, at the Bavla plant, I think Dishman has aggressively started manufacturing uh, a special range of hand sanitizers and disinfectants, which has been a forte of Dishman. And uh, that uh, plant is now operating 24 by 7 with uh, a very high quality disinfectant going in the market, which is also helping to some extent containment of this spread everywhere in the world, including in India. A thirdly, an obvious question that if first quarter has been a little bit impacted at Bavla, I think globally in most of our plants have continued to operate uninterrupted except, of course, subject to the adjustments and modifications as explained by Mark, that social distancing, work from home, etc. So overall, we believe, while it's a bit early for us to give you any guidance, we believe that for this year at least, if you discount the a little bit of underperformance in Bavla, I think still we should not see uh, an overall um, degrowth which could be maybe more than or around about 10% in FY21 as compared to FY20. But as I said, this is just an indication. It's a bit early for us to make any assessment. But overall, I will say that in terms of the number of late phase three drugs that are in pipeline, the huge opportunity that we see now as an integrated enterprise, uh, multiple plans, single strategy, single marketing focus, and a very unique business model, which we have, I think from a medium to long-term perspective, internally we continue to remain extremely bullish about the core strengths and uh, opportunities that Dishman is having and is likely to sustain its growth going forward. I think with uh, this moderator, you can throw the house open for Q&A. Thank you. We will now begin with the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask questions, may press star and one on your touchstone teleport. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking questions. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. To ask a question, please press star and one. Okay. The first question is from the line of Ashwini Agarwal from Ashmore, India. Please go ahead. Um, hi, good afternoon, team. Uh, a couple of quick questions. Uh, just uh, Sanjay Bhai's last comment uh, regarding a 10% uh, degrowth, uh, you know, as a guidance. I mean, I was just thinking about this number because initial comments from Arpit indicated that uh, the EDQM observations would affect the marketing molecule part of the business from Bavla, which is quite small in the overall context. So. You know, minus 10% for the aggregate company on a consolidated basis would also indicate uh, some other slow uh, growth in revenues or a decline in revenues in some other parts of the business. Is there something else that uh, we need to think about outside of marketing molecules at Bavla? 
so if you think about uh, i actually are there uh, if you uh, if, uh, if 10% is primary uh, is the marketable molecule business is about 15 uh, 15 15 odd million and uh, the the other degrowth is just on the terms if there is at all on the terms of the covid situation which did not allow us to ship any material to any of the customers because there was a global lockdown so that would that would just go in terms of calculating it within the fiscal year that would be seen as a degrowth because of the limited time frame otherwise business wise there would be no degrowth per se but uh, if you look at a two year scenario there would not be a degrowth but if you look because of this covid when the three months there was a total and complete lockdown this three months we can never get back so uh, So but that's that's April May June uh, you're referring to March April and May correct because June and uh, even most of the manufacturing plants especially in the pharma space at least in India started operating uh, pretty much uh, uh, you know from the middle of April so so which three months are you referring to and which geographies are you referring to this is mainly to uh, because most of our customers uh, the the non uh, marketable molecules and marketable so we are 99% export per se so even when you look at uh, carbogen amses or netherlands or france in this uh, complete lockdown uh, there was nothing that was shipped in the earlier quarters we tried to uh, mitigate that as much as possible but there was uh, there uh, uh, in uh, the, once once the, once we see that quarter that has uh, happened per se there is there will be a, a kind of uh, a degrowth because of this covid situation because of the supply of material was just limited okay and it's not so it's just about no, no, kind of five five or million just to be conservative it might happen it might not happen and ashwini i was very clear this is not a guidance but this right. is what we initially internally feel and i made a qualification statement that going forward as june and july progresses we might be able to you know see what best we can do to make it up but this is what we internally feel as of now so okay. okay. the maximum number that we would like to give you in terms of uh, uh, being prepared as uh, because it is just too early ashwini right right Uh, second question is for uh, you know on the two new approvals that uh, or two new products that have gone commercial during the quarter or have received uh, uh, regulatory approval uh, what are these products um, you know uh, is it possible for you to think uh, to talk about uh, the potential in the current financial year or on a medium term basis how, how should we think about them I think as as ever one of one of them actually is quite interesting because uh, it's for pneumonia and one of the uh, one of the collateral impacts of covid-19 is a rather virulent form of pneumonia which in certain subsets of patients is almost impossible to treat successfully this drug is actually showing some uh, efficacy in that subset of patients so that customer is uh, rather keen to get uh, additional commercial supplies this year. The challenge we have as you know is that we are very busy in Switzerland at the moment. So we're in discussions with the customer about how we're going to meet his uh, his short-term requirements. This wasn't on plan when we had our commercial planning meetings with them. So they need to bring some supplies forward. That could have a positive impact. Uh the other product is an oncology drug and uh will follow the normal path so uh, they have stock of material uh for launch which we've manufactured and uh we see what happens in the market but they're both very very fresh approvals in the last couple of months okay. and um, my last question is to harshil uh, harshil on the balance sheet i see almost a 200 pro increase in um, your uh, intangibles um, uh, what are the, what is this on account of goodwill spe- specific i was when yeah so this is just on account of the restatement of the goodwill at the closing exchange rate so you know as you know the the, the us dollar inr moved uh, significantly to about 75 60 or uh, as of 31st march 2020 so all of the goodwill gets restated at the closing exchange rate 
there is no there is no additional um, uh, there is no additional goodwill. It is just and, a and the increase of uh, it's a very small number about uh, you know ten odd crores in other intangible assets. What's that on account of? So that is again the same thing because uh, the 89 crores uh, increased to about 97 crores. So that 78 crores is just on account of the restatement again. Okay. All right. Okay. That's yeah. all. That's all from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Anil Shah from Billa Mutual Fund. Hi. Uh, you know, two questions actually. One. Uh, Mark, this is for you and Harshil both. You know, when I look at EBITDA uh, and reduce EBITDA for the foreign exchange gains, which are realized, my FY18 is about 426 crores, FY19 is about 438 crores, FY20 is 479. But if I adjust for the fact that lease, we had a change in the lease accounting and hence the lease cost, which normally come above EBITDA, this time has been pushed into depreciation, and hence depreciation or higher. I'm assuming that EBITDA was flat, more or less there. So last three years, our EBITDA is between 425 to 450 crores. Uh, you know, could you please yeah. explain what's happening? It's three years. You know, every call we keep saying that we are in really good shape, but and it's great opportunity, great potential. Uh, but last three years, numbers are in front of you. Would be happy to hear you out. Hi, Anil. So, uh, so Anil, it would not be right to just remove the forex component from the from the other operating income, because you know there would also be a negative forex impact on the overall cost structure as well. So, as you know, most of our costs are in foreign currency. Uh, the largest one being in Switzerland as well as in Netherlands. Harshil, so, uh, you yourself, Harshil, sorry to interrupt, but you yourself just, you know, excluded it just to make it make us clear that, you know, last year, fourth quarter was too high. The right. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, so, so I'm just doing the same thing, saying, you know, you remove the FX out and just see. It's been flattish. No, so what I'm trying to explain. For every other company in terms of, you know. No, no, so what, what, uh, so, uh, uh, I mean, by welcome back again uh, after many years. What we are trying to say is that if you remove the forex component uh, from uh, the last quarter gain, then you have to remove the subsequent impact on the cost as well, and then calculate the EBITDA. Because otherwise, you are keeping the EBITDA at a higher cost and removing the forex gain, which is showing the flattishness. Okay. So, so I, I agree to your point that uh, the, the, the 70 crores, which is the differential in the in the other operating income, which is purely on account of the forex gain, that definitely had an impact on the EBITDA this year. But what what the, the other impact which is that on the EBITDA is also on the cost front. So the all of the cost they are also getting restated at the, at the at the new foreign exchange rate. So I'm not saying the entire 70 crore uh, impact is that. I mean, the 70 crore impact is there in the EBITDA, but the differential does not represent only the 70 crore. It is minus the cost impact as well, which is this is built into the cost and the employee expenses as well. Uh, because the 62, just 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 for comparison, uh, Anibai, if you look at just the Swiss balance sheet uh, or the Swiss cost, the cost of people is about 62 million. Now the problem is that if you reinstate that in rupees in one year, you would be reinstating that at 68, and in the subsequent year, you have to reinstate that at 78. Just the Swiss franc. Right. The other thing is, could you please specify, uh, you know, and where is our gross debt? And net debt, and where exactly, in what currency, and which particular uh, entity it is lying, each of these things. Because you know, when I'm looking at the consolidated, uh, the uh, the consolidated cash flow that you sent across today, I just don't see. I just you know, mm -hmm. pardon me, pardon me for my ignorance, but I just can't see 20 million dollars of repayment that you know you're talking about. That 120 is being reduced to 100. So, could you please give me numbers specifically of gross debt at each entity level? And in what currency and the cash levels in each entity so that, you know, we come to a number which is, you know, what you're saying. Because as I said, consolidated cash flow 
I just can't see the twenty million dollars being repaid back. Yeah, sure. So, uh, I mean, right now I don't have it on hand. We can definitely take it offline. But uh, just to give you an idea, total brought that as of thirty first March twenty twenty was uh, rupee terms was one thousand fifty six crores. Uh, while the cash in cash equivalent, including the, the the liquid investments that we have, were close to about three hundred crores. The same figure as of thirty uh, first March two thousand nineteen. The growth set was about 900, uh, uh, 990 odd crores, while the cash and cash equivalents were about 200 crores. So th th these are kind of the broad figures, but I can get you uh, the foreign currency borrowings in each of the territories. Most of our borrowing is in US dollars, um, as well as in Swiss francs, and then we have certain amount of borrowings in euros as well. Sure. So, so you know, when I, think, in, uh, but I would like to have specific numbers for each, yeah? Sure, no problem. Absolutely fine. Yeah. The third, the third again is on the on the crash flow. So it's been two consecutive years now. We've seen an increase in inventory. Uh, so that's close to about 120 crore. If I add both the years back, and, and if I'm adding the you know both the years, increase in inventory is almost 64 and 58. So it's about 120 crores. You already mentioned an increase in trade receivables this year to the tune of about 125 crores. The question really is, uh, you know, what's happened to our working capital? I um, mean, you know, where are we, you know, working capital in terms of number of days, etc. And, you know, going forward, you know, could you just tell us, you know, how this will play out? So most of the increase in the inventory uh, this year is on account of, you know, as I mentioned, there were certain uh, shipments which could not go out uh, by the end of March. So that is uh, definitely having an impact on the on the increase in the inventory that you're seeing, and uh, this would be to the tune of uh, close to about five million, and that should go out in Q1 or in Q2. So so that's on the on the inventory, on the trade receivables I mentioned, uh, you know it's, it's largely on account of the service revenue or the percentage of completion matter that gets deployed. If you see on the liability side as well, the, the creditors have increased. So uh, the, the trade payables have increased from 195 crores to 284 crores. So yeah. overall, on a on an overall working capital cycle, if you see our total current assets, those are about uh, 1,800 crores, while our current liabilities are about 1,568 crores. Uh, uh, one of the important things to understand uh, in our working capital are the advances that we get from our customers because for many of these, or I would say for all of the development projects, we get uh, a lot of these advances from the customers and, uh, and, and, and that is what is sitting in our uh, current liabilities as well. So, uh, so that is already cash that I have received from the customers. So if you see our, uh, our current liabilities, other current liabilities, those have increased from 167 crores to 216 crores. So overall for the full financial year, on a gross basis, the working capital has remained more or less the same as what it was in the last financial year. So there has been not, um, I would say, an incremental investment in the working capital in the current financial year. Yeah, but you know, we've not seen a massive growth in the top line as well. So working capital from that perspective has right. not have gone up. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so there is no increase in the top line and hence there is no increase in the overall working capital as well. Mark, question to you, Mark. Uh, you know, since you're the global CEO, uh, we've we've in a sense uh, you know, we've seen a gross lock, if I'm correct, again, it's in the region of about three and a half thousand crores, plus or minus, and I don't know how to, you know, how exactly you really look at it from a good perspective. But our top line in the last five years for sales moved from about 1700 crores to 2000 crores. And we continue to do capex on a yearly basis, you know, part of it maintenance, part of it, um, you know, in terms of some growth capex, as you mentioned, uh, new building in Sibylian this time around, and some capex in India. Uh, you know, this turnover to sales ratio just doesn't seem, I mean, where, when do we really start seeing this commercialization of the, you know, large bouquet of, pro of products that we've been, you know, having for the last many years really playing out in terms of manufacturing and the top line growth really starting to come? Well, these uh, products generally, 
these, these commercial so much, just 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 to clear the first uh, question on the gross block actually the gross block calculation is totally and purely on the account of reinstatement according to the foreign currency which has moved most of our investments especially pertaining to india and of course abroad which were happening at an exchange rate of the rupee at possibly uh, at 50 uh, uh, 50 or uh, uh, rupees per dollar which has taken place and the new accounting standards have reinstated themselves at the current level the gross block is increasing because of the accounting standards per se it is not increasing on the actual investments that were made Okay. I think that needs to be clarified uh, uh, for sure. Uh, am I right, Rashid? Bhai? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. So, there, uh, so last year we had already done that calculation, so that impact is almost close to about uh, 500, 550 odd crores, which was there in the in, in the gross block. This year, uh, you know, again there has been an exchange rate movement by almost close to eight percent as compared to the last financial year. So that would be an additional impact which is sitting in the in the gross block. Okay. In terms of so now, now, Mark, you can go ahead. Yeah, please, Mark. Please, please, you know, in terms of when do we really see an accelerated revenue? I'm finding business? it very difficult to understand. It's uh, very. <laughs> Yeah, it is because we have to convert everything in rupees and that is the problem where it is an accounting entry rather than uh, the actuality. Okay. Right, and the other question was about uh, how long it takes for these these, these uh, validated processes to uh, to start to, yes. uh, to grow, yeah? Yeah, okay, yeah. So, in a general process, we're talking about validation, then you have about 12 months before things start to pick up and they start to see penetration in their market, the customers. Bear in mind, as we've said consistently, these are not our products. We're not in control of the regulatory filings. We're not in control of the marketing of the final products. So what we do is we manufacture the API, we qualify and validate the process, we provide documentation to the customer, and they do their filings. So generally, we see about a 12 to 18-month lag before commercial volumes start to come through. Most customers utilize validated compound as stock to do their launch volumes, okay? And normally the FDA is happy with that as long as the validations are straightforward and they don't have too many deviations. So this is what customers tend to do. And they build stock so that they can test the market without committing to large volume supplies. However, in that period of time, we're negotiating supply agreements with customers. Now, bear in mind that a lot of the products that we're doing in Switzerland, we are not chasing 50, 60, 100, 300 ton products because we don't have the capability to manufacture those. What we're chasing is high value, low volume products. So on average, the price per kilo is, is, is by degrees, you know, 10x what you would expect of a very large volume product, um, a very simple large volume product. So, you know, we're not chasing what we call blockbusters. And to be perfectly honest with you, I don't think there will be any more blockbusters. This is all about niche medicine these days. So, um, and that's where we play. We play in the high-tech, low-volume, high-value basis. And if you look at the Carvagenamsis Swiss boundary, you'll see yet again that there's been another record year. We've never done this much revenue and this much profit before. Sure. So what's happening is that our mix of development, and this is the other factor that we have to keep uh, maintaining. So while we're adding capacity, we've added capacity in development over the last two or three years, as you know, mostly in high-potency development. That development capacity is now being filled. So what we're now looking at is, is manufacturing, small-scale niche manufacturing capacity across the board. So that every time we add capacity in one area, it has a positive effect in the requirement for capacity in another area. So we're looking at an ideal mix at this. Our commercial revenues are around about $60, $60 million a year. And uh, that, that ratio of around about 35 to 40% commercial to to uh, development revenue, and then the rest is validation, is about the right sort of mix. Um, we know that if that mix works, then we get a fair proportion of things that are validated, 
because a lot of them die. So we're playing this knife edge of mix. If we go for commercial products and we just go for commercial products, we'll have two years of wonderful numbers. But then we won't have been doing any development work, which means our pipeline's empty. Our pipeline today, as we speak today, is $98 million. We are sitting on $98 million of pipeline. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty busy. Um, and, and what's happening is because we've added that additional capacity in development, we've filled it. Now we need to provide capacity to take what has been filled and take it to the next scale. Uh, so that's 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 the that's the, uh, the the fine line we walk and we have walked for you know, 25 years in the history of coverage. Yes. Yes. So, Mark, I think that, you know, uh, as far as the developing part is concerned, at Switzerland, completely understandable. We know this business well. We've been you know investors in this company for a long period of time now. I think the question was more to do with the fact that we were looking at some of those products finally going commercial. And the manufacturing of that moving to the Indian facility or the Indian manufacturing or the China manufacturing. Yeah. It was, it was already ready. The plants were ready and operational. Yes, and it's still happening. So we're working on products, either intermediate starting materials or even final products, which are being transferred over to India. And we've done, I don't know, RP, 15 tech transfers from Switzerland? Yes. Yes, minimum. It's got to be something like 15 tech transfers in the last 10 years since I've been back at Carbage and Amsis and Dishman. So we've done about 15. Of them. We've done a couple in uh, for China as well now. We, but as, as yeah, and we put, we put two in China. Yeah, and we put two in China because um, we we uh, we want to prioritise China as well as an asset that we need to uh, get better utilisation on. So where we need the volume, which we don't have in Switzerland, yeah. then India and China come into play. Right. Okay. But it's just a waiting game as of now, and COVID certainly doesn't help, as Mark said as well, that, you know, it is, it is not our uh, IP, it is not our product, so we are not in control of the market. It is, of, it is, it is dependent on our customers of when they want to stock. The validations have happened, and uh, as a thumb rule, after validation, that which is a uh, stock building, as Mark said, we have to wait for a year. For instance, if we talk about the Janssen product, uh, Bidaculin, which uh, we completed the validation, and they have done the stock building, which is uh, uh, reflecting in the last year of the revenue, they do not want uh, any material for one year. Yeah, and, and, and we, shouldn't, we shouldn't forget that the second most profitable product at Bavla is actually a GMP intermediate for Switzerland, which we transferred a few years ago. And that product is still is still growing, and we're still seeing a huge amount of revenue and margin coming through on that one for right. the standalone India. Okay. Uh, and there are a number of those going forward. So that philosophy is still embedded in our strategy going forward. Right. We will always be looking for the opportunity to move things to our Asian assets to take advantage of the scale of, scale of the operations. Sure. I have a few more questions. I'll get back into the queue. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you very much. The next question is from the line of Pranav Tendulkar from Rare Enterprises. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. So, uh, I think everybody understands that there been, uh, the revenue run rate in April, May, and June would have been lower. And uh, that would impact your annual revenue. But uh, if we see Q4 in next year, when we, we are supposed to have no disturbance from COVID, so I'm talking about March 21, then in that case, what could be your quarterly uh, revenue run rate? That is one. That is my first question. And second question is, what is your own analysis of uh, where are actual bottlenecks in terms of growth? And uh, how you are assessing them? Because if you clearly assess the bottlenecks and you invest resources in them, I see no reason why this company can can't grow at a much faster rate. Seeing whatever trends that I'm observing in other pharma and API and crack businesses. So just these two questions to start. Thanks a lot. So to answer the second question first, we have established a tremendous bottleneck uh, in, uh, in Switzerland where we have uh, done almost uh, close to uh, 18 validations 
but uh, now we have uh, zero capacity to uh, make more than nine of them commercial. Right, Mark? Yeah. So yeah. then we have, uh, uh, if, even if we expect uh, out of the hundred that we have, which is thirty uh, percent of success. We are looking at another uh, six odd uh, validations, or validated molecules going um, uh, going to launch, sure. for which we don't have a single uh, uh, manufacturing vessel available. For which reason we have we have planned a strategic API building manufacturing um, investment to be the here in Spain. So that is already in the books and already in the plan. So that is one major bottleneck. The other bottleneck that uh, we have uh, helped is by uh, giving the large uh, 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 asset of China under the Swiss uh, arm uh, uh, of carbon analysis is allowed uh, many uh, many of the non-GMB uh, uh, work that Swiss was doing to be transferred into China to make the Chinese assets uh, profitable. So one thing that we are missing to see is that a loss is also a cost which a less loss is basically a gain in revenue, where in China we would have seen the loss uh, uh, being reduced year on year, which is also on largely on the account of gaining of the revenue. But because it's a loss, it's not seen. But that has helped carbon analysis to achieve the 150 million just in Switzerland, which, as Mark said, is a historical year. It has never happened in Swiss's existence. And it, it was never even imagined to happen that it is possible. But because of all of these bottlenecks that have been identified, this has taken place and it has happened. At the same time, the bleedings have reduced in terms of China and other assets which were bleeding. Uh, so this uh, identifying of the bottlenecks and uh, everything is a, is a constant practice that our business takes, takes, which our business requires. Uh, to perform and it is happening it is just that we are conservative we don't want to uh, make the same mistake as we did in the past that we make investments just on the basis of anticipation but we make investments on a 50 50 mix of anticipation and certainty before it was 100 percent anticipation which left which which which, which, which made us burn our fingers now we have found an ideal mix of 50% anticipation and 50% certainty, for which reason we are confident to make a large investment to help Switzerland de bottleneck its uh, current scenario because otherwise it is not just that we lose the six products, it's that we lose, we start to lose the brand name where uh, people will start to think that carbon analysis is full, it has a timeline of one year, and it will not be able to manufacture any commercial products, so there is no point of even giving them the development work. Hello. You see, Arp, it's absolutely right. The issue is very simple. If you, we, we need in Switzerland to do more commercial products, then without expanding, then we have to stop doing development work to provide capacity for uh, commercial manufacturing. If we stop development work in 18 months to two years, the pipeline will be empty. So it's this game of kissing frogs. Uh, we need enough frogs in the funnel so that when we start kissing frogs, we find one or two princes which are the commercials. And it's a cycle, and it's a known cycle. This is not a surprise. We know that the market has appetite for what we do, and development is where we create the, uh, the technology and the capability, the innovation. And commercial manufacturing is where we reap the reward. And you can see that the system is working very nicely. I mean, you know, for the last five years, we've had record sales. And EBITDA is getting better. We're getting more efficient as we get busier. But we've reached the point now where we just can't squeeze anything else in. And if we want to continue to grow, we have to, we have to expand in certain areas. And we understand where those bottlenecks are. And we know when they're coming, generally speaking. So none of this is a surprise to us. Right. So, so the new manufacturing capacity that just you, know, you just alluded, uh, when it is coming on stream? We we are anticipating about uh, 24 months, 24 to 34 months. Okay. Okay. So second thing. Uh, and in the meantime, and just just to preempt your next question, how are we going to deal with the shortfall in the next 24 to 30 months? Yeah. We have a number of enabling projects which are underway already 
to enable us to bridge the gap between the um, the investments. So these are smaller dollar ticket investments that are not outside the range of normal capex, and I'm sure Hashil can can talk to that. But those enable us to bridge the gap between now and the next 24 to 30 months. Great. Right, and about my first question, that is quarterly. Yeah, and, and Pranav, yeah, so Pranav, regarding your first question, you know, what uh, we have been saying on the calls is that you know, it's very difficult to give like a, like a quarterly estimate of, you know, what we would be achieving in a, in a particular quarter. Uh, it would be more prudent to see our business uh, on a two-year basis or at least a one-year basis. So what we believe is that, or what we can say right now is that the second half of the year looks to be to be much stronger than the first half of the year, uh, largely because of the reasons that we have cited uh, for, for the for the Babla facility and uh, because of the COVID-19. So you know that that's kind of the of, of the broad uh, guidance on the on the overall year. Right, right, right. So, so just uh, uh, so just last uh, last question. So, you don't see any CGMC approved uh, facility which can be acquired. Meanwhile, if that's not the possibility. No, we've looked. Uh, we've looked, and the problem is that at the moment, most assets that are available are large scale, ex large pharma assets, and they're not really tailored to to what we do. Yeah. So, in acquiring that asset. You know, the asset is one thing, but you have to acquire the people as well. And when you acquire the people, you acquire all the pension liabilities of a large pharma company. So we've looked at those, and we're still actively looking. Until we buy the first piece of uh, major capital equipment, we will not stop looking for a potential asset to buy. But be aware that when you buy an asset, you know, it's not going to be, you know, we, we acquire it on Friday, and on Monday we're in production. Um, yeah. there's, there's still a lag time, of course. But what it does do is it does save you time. There's, undeniably, it saves you time if it's the right asset. It may save you a third of the for time. Months. Yeah, yeah. But it may save you a third of the time, but it gives you a, 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 a 100% of the hassle. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we are looking, and we continue to look. We've We've actually audited a couple of plants, and one of them we looked at actually looked very interesting, and Arpit and I sat down with the uh, the company that was facilitating the uh, sale, and uh, we had an estimate and we uh, of what it would cost, and we put a premium on that estimate, and when they shared what their, uh, uh, their uh, expectations were, it was actually cheaper for us to build it and build it our way to exactly what we want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Deepan Shankar from Trust Line. Please Yeah, thanks a lot for the opportunity. Uh, with the FDA approval, Sejula uh, Mirapare is now is the only oral uh, monotherapy for first line maintenance treatment. So, what is the kind of opportunity size uh, which has improved for Sejula and uh, have we also got any updates on possibility of increased orders from uh, Glaxo? No, we have not gotten any update from the, uh, from, from Glaxo. What we believe is uh, that they have uh, built on enough stock that could uh, help them continue for uh, the longest period. Uh, we have done our analysis from looking at uh, the revenues, uh, uh, the, the past revenues of uh, the company which was in existence, which was Tesaro, and uh, to the revenue uptake of GSK in terms of the oncology product line, where the kind of, uh, the amount of material that we have shipped, considering that with the dosage, I don't, we, we don't believe that they have even used even the tenth of the stock that has been purchased. So, uh, to be honest with you, we do not see anything uh, coming in from, for at least for next two years in terms of Niraparib, uh, just based on the stock building that they have done. But since it is a market, we may be surprised. But that is something that we have uh, written off from our, from our uh, potential. 
Okay, so uh, there has been no change in terms of uh, sourcing contract relationship with uh, the AXO, right? Uh, so, uh, are they sourcing from any other parties, sir? As of now, according to the stocks that they have been built, we believe they, they, they don't. Um, am I right, Mark? Yeah, you're right. We had a meeting set up for them at, uh, with them at DCAT in uh, February, end of February, early March. But, of course, that show was cancelled. Um, so we're still due to have a face-to-face -face discussion with them, and that may happen at CPHI, which is in September, if that, that shows on. Um, but at the moment, our view is that the, the material that we've shipped, plus the knowledge of what the other vendor has shipped, uh, plus their dose range, we, we, we think they're sitting on quite a bit of material. Okay, okay. And uh, still ask me please. regulatory questions for them, by the way. We're still supporting them when uh, uh, supporting them with regulatory answers that they're getting asked by various agencies. So it's obvious there's still quite a bit of activity in the in the in the global market where they're looking at filing in different countries. That's obvious from the questions they're asking and information okay. they're requesting from us. So. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, lastly, any update uh, from uh, tax authorities uh, over here? So, if we have not got any, so can we assume that uh, uh, issue has been resolved now? Ashish Bhai, you want to take that or should I do so, uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, I'll, I'll just explain. So, obviously, you know, we haven't received any kind of official communication from the IT department. So, uh, you know, that's the same level of knowledge that you have, that we have. And, uh, you know, we have cooperated with them. We have answered all their queries. All the necessary documents, information has already been supplied to them. Uh, so what we understand is that there is nothing material uh, which could have any kind of uh, a major impact on the company that should come out of this. Uh, but, yeah, obviously we haven't heard anything official from them. Okay, sure. Thank you, Andal. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ilesh Gopani from Gopani Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. I am just asking the question regarding the buybacks. Sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Gopani, but we can barely hear you. you can speak a little louder. Uh, uh, hi, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I have the question regarding the buyback of the shares. We had originally planned the buyback of rupees 72,000, 72 crores, and we have just done half the buyback. So why we have stopped the buyback? We, we have the time up to 24th July, and the price is raised in the range that we have thought of buying. So why don't we stop in the COVID, COVID circumstances, we have to prepare for the future. We have to safeguard the company for the future. So that, but that was originally planned, no? And we are not going to buy, we are going to buy only 20, 30 crores now, again. COVID, COVID, so COVID I don't think that 20, 30 crores will affect much. So, so obviously, you know, we announced the buyback in January, where, when obviously we didn't have the knowledge of the, of the COVID. Uh, uh, the buyback announced was for 72 crores and, uh, you know, as you would have seen every month, uh, every other week, we had been buying up till the time that the COVID-19 actually started showing signs of kind of a slowdown in India and elsewhere. So that was the reason, you know, we just thought that it would be better to be more cautious right now. Uh, because, you know, we don't know till what time and to what extent the impact could have been. Um, as it seems as of now that the impact should keep on dying down. Uh, but, you know, we were just being extra cautious. Uh, that, that was the reason, you know, why the entire buyback was not completed earlier, if, if that was the question. But we have already completed about 50% of the buyback. That is according to the requirements. But our book value is 300. You know and these are the times we have the last opportunities. We will not get another opportunity for buyback at this price. This is our lowest price in many years. So to increase the shareholder value, uh, we can always uh, have another 20-30 crores loan and buy back this. This price is the lowest price in the last three years. And we will not have another opportunity for doing that buyback. 
No, no. So, Elijah, uh, obviously, you know, the regulation does not permit to take a loan for the buyback. Uh, so, we would definitely, uh, if, if, I mean, for the, for the remaining no, no. part of the buyback. We are taking the loan for the business, not for a buyback. <laughs> we are, you are just informing that we have stopped the buyback because we want to preserve ourselves for COVID. No, I don't think this is a 20 30 crores is a big amount for the company. No, no, we have to preserve ourselves in terms of being not knowing the global impact of COVID, where the uh, where the Western world is yet to see the recession. So, for a company who is in 100% exports, who is dependent on the Western world, they have to take uh, norms to make sure that they do not become inexistent just to complete the buyback, uh, which is uh, which is a luxury. It's not a necessity. Ashil, by 20, 30 crores will not be affecting the company in any way. It will affect the equity capital only. Anyway, that's my reason and it's for the shareholders' value and it is for the benefit of the company. That's why I'm asking this question. Anyway, thanks for the opportunity. No, so, so I mean, that, that was the intent with which uh, we announced the pipeline of the 72 crores and, uh, and that is what uh, we intended to do. But obviously, nobody expected the COVID-19. So, uh, you know, we're not talking about the COVID-19 impact just on us. But as uh, Arkhiji mentioned, this is talking about the global economy, where we are already seeing, you know, a lot of these companies having layoffs and uh, you know, and slowdown, and there could be a scenario of a recession as well. So that was the reason we just said that, you know, let, let, let us be extra cautious, maybe for 30, 40 days, let's see how the situation pans out, and then we can again restart the buyback. So we have time up to 24th July. Yeah, yeah, things could get better. It's never known. But what needs to be also understood is that since our, all our uh, uh, currencies are in uh, foreign currency, you can also imagine that our buyback cost has been has also been made a loss to us by almost 10%, which is the currency appreciation from the time that we have uh, gathered the money for buyback because we are not allowed to keep the risk. Uh, Anyway, you can so see for other yeah. days and then have a call and we have time other than 24 days. The 70 levels is now coming at 76, 70. It will be situation that should is not. If we have to be coming on the term, that's an percent equity the appreciation which should be on the account of foreign currency. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Deepan Mehta from Alexa. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. One minute, sir. Yes. So my question is more of a macro nature that because of this particular pandemic uh, in your in, in interaction with clients, do you think that uh, overall R&D spend globally will increase in healthcare and indirectly that will benefit you in terms of higher projects? Uh, in the medium term, I know these are all of long term trends, but uh, is that a possibility at all? I think there's a couple of things that are playing uh, here, and we won't know until until we start to emerge out of this. But I think there are two competing things. Uh, you're right that healthcare right now, pharmaceutical specifically, um, has a high level of interest in the general public. Um, and if it has a high level of interest in the general public and venture capital money, um, obviously we'll see further opportunities. So, as you know, if you've been talking to us over a period of time, you know that one of the key metrics we look at is the amount of venture capital money going into pharmaceuticals. That is a key metric for us to see whether or not the market is slowing. Today, we don't see that um, the market is slowing. However, on the other side of this, what we also see is politically, we are starting to see a move towards more nationalism. And by that, I mean countries looking at taking calls on stimulating their own internal markets again so that they are to a degree self-sufficient on pharmaceuticals. That is a longer play. And of course, every four years, politicians change and uh, they move seats and things. But we're seeing that as a competing strategy potentially emerging as well. So a rise in nationalism, uh, especially in the United States and in countries like Holland and to a degree in France and Italy, we're seeing that politically. 
Whether or not that's achievable, I don't know, because a lot of those businesses have been gone from the West for many, many years. And re-establishing those um, in the short term is going to take an awful lot of investment and an awful lot of time. So, um, so those are the two things that we see emerging out of COVID, frankly. One of them is good news. The other one is not necessarily bad news either, because... Um, you know, we, Europe is, you can treat as one continent, essentially, and Switzerland is ideally placed from a tax perspective. So uh, we don't see that. So there is a potential risk for our U.S. business. However, um, it would take an awful long time to rebuild the infrastructure to do the sort of work that we do beyond the companies that already exist there. So if that were to happen, it would be at least five to eight years before there would be any significant impact on our business. And by then, we would have had a, uh, a strategy in place to deal with that. So, um, so and so then people would realize that uh, right to nationalism is actually debt to capitalism, which again is not going to be very much appreciated. <laughs> no, but again, interaction, you know, interaction with your clients do not do you get the sense that uh, they want to invest more into new molecules and Pick up, you know, yes. the next yeah, yeah. Well, this is the point about venture capital money. This is the point about VC money, especially in the U.S. So VC money is is, and, and we call it vulture capitalism. <laughs> <My apologies. laughs> That's what we call it. Um, and what happens is these guys are in for three to five years maximum, and we see that there is no slowing of VC money going into small to medium biopharma. There is no slowing down. So that implication is very clear. There is money going in. There is, if money's going in, then new molecules are being developed. So we don't see a slowdown. We don't see a slowdown in inquiries. So we're still getting the same number of average inquiries that we have for the last two or three years. Our biggest challenge today is our ability to address those inquiries uh, because of capacity. But that's always going to be a moving piece for this company. You know, as soon as we create capacity in one area, we move the bottleneck somewhere else. And in 18 months or two years, that bottleneck is a real bottleneck, and then we have to address it. And that's the way it's always been in this company. I've known the company 20 years. And that's the way it works. Uh, and it's all driven by VC money. Um, and we don't see a slowdown today. I was having a discussion yep. with my head of sales and marketing only two days ago. And, and we don't see a slowing down. What will happen next month, I just don't know. But right now, we don't see a slowdown. So essentially, what may happen is, and this is a pure assumption, is that if the COVID scare is going to help in increase the premiums for uh, the insurance companies, then we might even say, and uh, we might even see an increase in uh, inquiries. No, but we, we, yeah. we don't have any capacity. So what I'm understanding from your uh, con call so far is that we have reached a particular stagnation level when it comes to turnover. Unless we have